Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Insightful Thinkers podcast, in-depth analysis into a diverse set of topics. So uh, today, the in-depth analysis will be about ex machina and, uh, and well, not just ex machina, but also about artificial intelligence and uh, just a discussion about that and where um, where kind of our advancements in artificial intelligence technology could take us as well as, as some ethical considerations with with it. So um, it kind of, this line of thought kind of started with watching that movie along with reading a couple, a couple interesting books, one being Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari. And uh, that book has some interesting uh, questions raised about artificial intelligence, where that will take us. And, um, and what it means for there to be truly advanced AI. This this book, as well as uh, as well as the movie, kind of just dis- discuss that and and a little bit of the blurred lines, kind of that there could be between humans and very advanced artificial intelligence if we continue to advance far enough with it. So, some of the analysis is going to be about uh, ex machina. Some of it is just going to be about. Um, kind of the blurred lines between humans and, and AI in general. So um, to start, we will discuss a couple important topics that um, actually even before I start, I think it's just like just like the parasite analysis. I think uh, I forgot almost forgot to say spoiler alert. So <clears throat> spoiler alert because there will be um, spoilers for Ex Machina. So watch that movie if you haven't already, um, because we're going to discuss some of the plot not in too much length. More of it is just going to be about um, artificial intelligence in, in general, but um, it would be worth it to watch that before you listen to this. Um, yeah, so so first of all, just the movie kind of got across that idea about the, the blurred lines between humans and artificial intelligence. So um, it started with, with what's called the Turing test. So the Turing test is basically the test of a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. So um, basically what happens is that there's a human on one side of maybe a screen, um, and then there are two people that you are involved in a conversation conversation with. So one of those people is a machine and uh, and one is obviously a human and the communication is through a text only medium. So it would have to, for instance, come to your computer screen because um, so that you wouldn't know by based on the looks of it, who you're talking to. So you don't know who you're talking to. It's just coming from from text. And basically what what the idea of the Turing test is, this was developed by Alan Turing, a British mathematician not exactly sure when, I think it was in uh, the mid 20th century around there, but um, basically the idea of it is if the evaluator cannot reliably distinguish the machine or the robot or artificial intelligence from the human, then this robot uh, is said to have passed the Turing test or passed the test. So um, this is the idea that if we advance enough with our um, artificial intelligence technology will eventually get to the point where it'll be indistinguishable from um, talking to that the, compared to talking to a human. And that's kind of what the ex machina is kind of about. It's like they, they kind of run this, uh, excuse me, this Turing test and uh, he can't really, there's really no way to tell that this is a robot. Um, now Caleb in the movie, he's, uh, one of the main characters he's involved in this Turing test and he, we'll talk about this later, but he initially has some reservations about, um, if they're actually performing the Turing test correctly, because he's not supposed to be able to see the robot right in front of him and then decipher if this thing has intelligence, he's supposed to, it's supposed to be through a text only medium. So he has some reservations about it and we'll talk about that in, uh, about the plot in a second, but, um, it, this is an important thought experiment kind of for the movie because it gets to the idea that will we ever get to that point where uh, artificial intelligence will have this um, this ability to be indistinguishable from a human. So that's one thing that we just need to kind of get out of the way and, and define our terms before we get into more of an in-depth analysis. So there's also the Chinese room thought experiment. This is another thought experiment in uh, artificial intelligence I guess, research or discussion. And uh, so, so this is kind of what the Chinese room experiment is. So using a rule book for translating Chinese, someone inside a room reads Chinese symbols sent into the room and sends back answers using a rule book to match Chinese symbols to English words. 
Um, so even though this this thing may successfully spit back answers, it has no idea what the symbols, the Chinese symbols actually mean if, if they were just to get them and to read them, if it didn't have that rule book. So essentially the algorithm or this machine inside this Chinese room um, has an indirect understanding of Chinese, but still to someone outside the room, uh, it may seem no different than someone who actually understands how to read Chinese. So what are the implications of this Chinese room experiment? Well, just because a computer can translate text using an algorithm, it doesn't mean that it actually understands Chinese at uh, at, at its core, you know, or <laughs> understands the language at its core. So it simply knows how to translate the symbols so masterfully and its algorithm was uh, created so pristinely that it's indistinguishable from someone who actually has a true understanding in the Chinese room. So say there was someone who actually knew how to read Chinese in the Chinese room. They read the information because they understand it. They read the Chinese symbols and they write back in Chinese and send that back out to the observer. Um, and, and, and that's what the observer gets. Or on the other hand, there's the machine who doesn't understand Chinese. It just has like a, an algorithm for, okay, if, if the, uh, the Chinese symbol looks like a house or it has three lines or whatever, then that's what it means. And then this is how you write it back. So there's this indirect understanding there that a machine could have that a regular human doesn't. Um, so it gets at the question of, of advanced robots possibly being able to pass the Turing test without true understanding. Um, if their answers are just like a human, um, like just like the human that's in the in the Chinese room, and both the answers are spit out just the same way, you can't tell if it's a robot or a human, and you don't know if the human or the robot understands um, what you're feeding it. Maybe it it doesn't matter if it truly understands what you're saying if it's indistinguishable anyway. So that's kind of what Ex Machina got at as well. Like, do you need a an in depth or a an underlying understanding of something? to be considered, for instance, like conscious or, or to have true advanced intelligence. Maybe you don't need the actual understanding. Maybe if you can uh, feign it or fake it to a certain extent, then that's good enough for being perceived as conscious or as, uh, as, uh, yeah, as an, as an intelligent being. So, and the final thought experiment here is, is the Mary's room thought experiment. So this was actually explicitly, um, talked about in the movie and by Caleb, again, the main character who was involved in the, uh, in the test with Ava, the robot to see if she has artificial intelligence or if she has consciousness or whatever. So the Mary's room thought experiment is kind of goes this way. So Mary knows everything there is to know about color. Okay. So she knows the properties. She knows the neurological effects. She knows exactly every property about red or blue or green. She knows, right? but she only lives in a black and white room. So once she sees the color, she learns something that all her studies could not tell her. She learns what it feels like to see color. So even though she has a true understanding, and this is kind of, um, kind of like if, if it were a robot who, uh, who, who kind of doesn't really know what it, it, it feels like. They just have an understanding with an algorithm, with a very advanced algorithm. They know exactly what blue is. They can define blue is this is where it is on the spectrum, or this is the wavelength or whatever, or this is green. And this is what it means. It, it, it's not until you actually step outside this, this box where you truly understand what it is, what it feels like to see a color. I know what it feels like to see the colors that I'm seeing. So can robots feel that it does, is, are we ever going to get to that stage? <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, but the idea is that in the, in the movie, they kind of get at the idea that maybe it doesn't matter if robots really feel it deep down, if they can feign it automatically with an algorithm, similar to, uh, to the Chinese room experiment, if they can pretend to know language, or if they can pretend to feel, uh, what, what the color is like, um, maybe that's advanced enough, you know, this high level faking may, maybe all that's necessary to be considered as conscious. Um, now, at the end of the movie, there's the, there's a scene, see, this is what I'm saying about spoilers. I'm already basically spoiling the entire end of the movie. But, um, so at the end of the movie, Ava, she walks, she's on in the streets of busy New York and, um, she, she's on the streets and, and no one even notices she's a robot. So she, while Ava, the robot stands in the busy street at the end of the movie and everyone walks by. It implies that nobody will ever know she's simply pretending anyway. So maybe this subjective feeling doesn't matter for something to perceive, be perceived as conscious. Maybe it doesn't matter if Ava will ever 
feel emotionally what it's like to see the big city or the city lights if she can pretend that she knows what it's like and and be pre- and pretend like she's kind of like a human or, or or whatever then maybe no one will be able to tell the difference between her and a human and she'll pass the turing test and she can be perceived as as a conscious organism just like everybody else so um maybe it doesn't matter if that feeling is there uh is, is totally there. Now, the movie also uh, gets at something uh, interesting as well. There's there's a painting in, in the movie. It's Jackson by Jackson Pillock, and it's, it's an automatic art drip painting. So, the way Jackson Pillock painted this was he basically just kind of splattered his paintbrush at the... Uh, he basically splattered his paintbrush at the... Um, at the canvas and he tried to paint automatically without thinking at all and nathan in the movie he is the one who has developed these robots and he's running these tests he says um so he jackson pillock would never have made a mark if he didn't paint until he knew exactly what he was going to do so the challenge is not to act automatically the challenge is to find an action that is not automatic so we think that a lot of our actions are are kind of, are not automatic and uh, we choose to do these things we put in a great deal of thought before we do a lot of things but maybe everything is more automatic than we think and maybe we are more similar to these advanced robots uh, than we think that's kind of what the movie's getting across because um we we may overestimate the control we have over our decisions we may be more like an algorithmic robot than than it seems because when you think about it what is driving your behavior is it a magical um where do these thoughts come from is it coming out of thin air is it uh is it some magical spark that comes out of nowhere Or, or what is it what do you think it is well there aren't really too many factors that seem that uh could possibly drive your behavior it's it's really your genes, a combination of your genes and your environment and the environment you experience, how that can uh, methylate DNA and change your genes and change your genetic code and make you more prone to this or more, uh, make you more keen on doing something different or make you uh, more aversive to certain things and it can modulate your brain and things like that. So what really are the factors that drive our behavior in the end anyways? Is it are we too kind of algorithmic and uh, <laughs> maybe not quite like a robot, but to a certain extent, don't you see how those those lines could be blurred? So I think that's what they're trying to get. Um, the movie's kind of getting across there a little bit. Like the challenge is to find something that's not automatic. Like what do we do that that is not just, uh, that, yeah, like that is not automatic, you know? So um you know, after all, as I said here, we're mostly just a product of our environment, just just like the robots. So just like the robot, they're only a product of the way we created them and, and the algorithm that they are running on or whatever. So, for instance, at the end of the movie where I mentioned she was standing, Ava was standing in the busy street, um, she the clothes she chose to wear guess what clothes they were they were the they were the clothes that she saw on her on her picture frame um when she was locked in in uh, kind of nathan's quarters or the experimenting room kind of thing her, in her room the only picture was this picture of someone wearing or i don't i can't remember if it was someone wearing it or if it was just the clothes themselves but um the clothes she chose to wear were the, identical to those so that's kind of similar to humans as well. Like whatever we see and whatever clothes that we see uh, are popular or that we, or what our culture wears around us, that's just what we put on. So we kind of operate on some kind of a a similar way. Like we, what we perceive in our environment, that's what the behavior we put out. So kind of like the robot, Ava, the only clothes that she saw, that's what she was going to wear because that's all she knew. So it's kind of blurring the lines there and, and maybe not blurring the lines, but more than anything, drawing parallels between uh, humans and artificial intelligence robots like that. So um, also in the movie, there was a scene where Caleb, um, he, he became very confused and very, um, he had a lot of issues with what was happening and how real these robots were appearing to him. So Caleb, he started, he actually started cutting his wrists um, because everyone around him looking so real made him believe that he may be a robot too. He better make sure that he doesn't have any uh, wiring inside of him. Is this all some weird <laughs> kind of almost black mirror-ish kind of thing? Like, is this, am I a robot as well? So 
even the human in this situation, he was acting based on his environment because if everyone around him is these super high performing artificial intelligence robots, maybe he could be one too. So maybe he should make sure that he's not a robot as well. So humans as well kind of act, act um, kind of based on their environment too. There's a bit of a parallel there between the humans and the robots. Um, Caleb actually became so attached to this idea that he might be a robot that he ended up siding, literally siding with the robots in the end to his own undoing. So he ended up siding with Ava, the robot, to to let her out, even though it was actually it was all a test. He was actually the rat in the experiment, and it was Ava's test to see if she could manipulate a human enough to escape. And he got manipulated um, because he kind of almost sided with the robot. So. He's behaving based on what's in his environment and what he is is surrounded by Um, because he was just with Ava every single day. So he he developed a connection to the robot, you know. Um, So maybe we are shaped by our environment no less than a very advanced AI would be. We have to, I think, think about that a little bit. And I'm not saying that this is something that will um, be developed immediately or even within the next decade or whatever. I don't really know the time span. I don't know how quickly the research is advancing, but it's not out of the question to, um, to kind of see, uh, the, the advancement that could come. And, and, um, if, if an AI is advanced enough, how similar could it really be to a human? We don't know that I think is, is more of uh, where I stand. We don't know. Um, but I think the movie ha- <laughs> kind of was p- putting forth more of a, uh, as if AI will be advanced quick, more quickly than we think, and we should be a little bit weary of what's to come. So, um, it kind of it kind of sparked that discussion about our state of progress um, and how we are truly just products of our, of our environment. So, look at us. Compare us to, for instance, ancient Egyptians. So, just like them, we're humans. They were humans. We're humans, obviously. But look how far we've come since then. Um, now, why is this? Are we smarter than the ancient Egyptians? No, I don't. Our brain has not uh, evolved and developed this much throughout that many, only this many generations, like a few thousand years or 4,000 years or whatever, that our brain is um, <clears throat> actually better at uh, processing things, maybe slightly. We don't really know that for certain, but we do know is we're humans just like them. Why have we advanced civilization so much since then? Well, yeah, clearly it's not because we are we're uh, smarter or in different species. It's the same species. It's just that we just are building on environment progress that we see in our environment um, and that we have created for ourselves. So, <clears throat> so, um, so yeah, we're kind of just products of our environment, just like, of our environment, just like these robots. You know, these uh, these robots. I guess they're fully products of their environment because. Um, if, if we program an artificial intelligence to be to be that way, then we literally created them. But we're kind of similar in a certain extent because what's in our, in our environment really has an impact on us and changes us and allows us to think new things like that. So there's that parallel again, I think, that this movie was trying to get across. So um, there's actually a quote that kind of follows the same line of thought is uh, Nathan. He says, one day the AIs are going to look back at us the same way we look back at fossils in the plains of Africa, an upright ape living in dust with rudimentary language and tools all set for extinction. So (laughs) this kind of gets to the, how, um, I guess you could say how, uh, not overzealous, but extremely, uh, a, a, a very uh, excited outlook that the creators of this movie have on where AI, how AI will overtake humans. We don't know if that's going to be the case, but that's kind of what Nathan says here is if at least Nathan in the movie has a very uh, excited stance on it. Well, I guess not excited because he, he is acknowledging that humans are going to go extinct and AIs are going to replace us. Who knows? That could be the case, but but either way, it's kind of the idea that uh, AIs are going to, they're going to look back on us just like we look back at like ancient humans too. So there's always building blocks and different stages and we don't really know what stage we're in because whether it's AI or whether it's, uh, or whether it's actual still humans or whatever in a thousand, two thousand years, um, if <laughs> who knows if the, the the earth will even last that long with climate change and whatnot happening now, but say it is a thousand, two thousand years in the future, how are they going to look back at us? You know, 
Yeah, and you got to think like we think we're so advanced, but they're going to we're going to be very rudimentary to them, just like the ancient Egyptians. I mean, they had no idea that they would their civilization, their incredible civilization, civilization that they created would be looked back on and kind of I mean, we, we still do marvel at some of their creations. There's no doubt about that. But we still see that their language was very rudimentary and their writing and their symbols they used and. But now look at us, we're going to be just like some ancient Egyptians to something down the line too. So what I put here is that we think we can't be more advanced, but we're going to be ancient creatures compared to whatever studies us in the future, whether it's AI, like kind of Nathan states in the movie, or whether it's humans. So it's on us, the uh, essentially the rulers of, of the earth currently to, to pave the right path for whoever or whatever comes after us. So that was kind of one of the themes in the movies too, in the movie as well was kind of the idea of with great power comes great responsibility. Like if we are, if we have the power to create these things, we have to be responsible with our creation and what we are, uh, and what we're putting out. So, um, but I'll continue here and into a discussion about actually, as I mentioned from the book Homo Deus by Yuval Noah Harari, um, so he indicates that, um, and not just him, but uh, there have been experiments where researchers uh, stimulate pleasure centers of, of a rat's brain using implanted electrodes, electrodes after it does a desired task. Um, so this is the quote from the book. So, and it, it kind of ties in with, with, uh, with ex machina and artificial intelligence a little bit. So the quote from the book is, uh, the rat's desires are nothing but a pattern of firing neurons. What does it matter whether the neurons are firing because they are stimulated by other neurons or if they are stimulated by transplanted electrodes connected to a remote control? If you ask the rat about it, she might say, sure, I have free will. I want to turn left. I turn left. I want to climb a ladder and I climb a ladder. Um, so the idea here is that even though the rat, the rat is controlled um, by electrodes from, from researchers who are stimulating certain areas of the brain that um, that cause it to do certain behaviors. But how would the rat know this? The rat is just behaving, thinking it has free will, thinking, hey, I wanted to climb a ladder, so I climbed the ladder. Isn't that free will? But it's not really free because the researcher was making their brain cause them to do that, right? So this is similar to the idea with artificial intelligence of um, if we program them in a certain way, and then they do whatever based on that. They they want to escape from this prison they were in, or they want to walk the streets of New York, and they do it. Do they have free will? If they or or are they just programmed to have those certain uh, tendencies and drives? And this is where that parallel may, might exist between AI and humans, because just like us, we're programmed in a small sense with from our genes. So when I say I want to have a drink of water. <laughs> which I do actually want to have right now. But if I want to have a drink of water, why do I want to have a drink of water right now? Am I not programmed in a sense to feel thirst or to my throat gets a little bit dry to want to have a drink of water? Why do I want that? What is making me want that? It's partly due to my genes and my environment. Maybe I'm in a dry environment or maybe I've been talking for a long time, whatever. But all it is is a mix of my genes that um, make it a, a, make me want to drink water, make it a positive thing for me to want to drink water and my environment because I'm thirsty. So how are we so different than AI than anyways, if we are programmed and then we act, act on our desires An AI might do the same. They might be programmed and then act on desires too. But where did those desires come from? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe if we program their desires or kind of like us, if our genes programmed our desires, we may not be so different after all. So kind of like the rat here, um, the rat says, Hey, sure. I have free will. I want to turn left to turn left. I want to climb a ladder. I climb a ladder. Why do you want to do that in the first place? That's what it comes down to. And, but maybe it doesn't matter because who would be able to tell that the rat is controlled by an experimenter or is just climbing the ladder on his own? Nobody knows. So whether that's why I'm um, at the end of the movie, no one was able to tell that Ava was a robot and not a human because Who's able to tell that she is, she's just looking around at the big lights, just like you are. And you're walking down the street too. And whether Ava was programmed or not, it doesn't, you can't tell. So just the idea of, um, like that parallel there, like if you can't, and I guess I'm having a little bit of trouble explaining this, but if you can't tell 
the difference between a behavior of uh, of the programmed rat or the non-programmed rat or the programmed AI and the non-programmed human. And maybe they are just one in the same anyway. Maybe they're both conscious and maybe they are acting on their desires and it doesn't matter where those desires came from deep down. They're very similar in the end. That's I think that was the beauty of this movie. That's what it really got to. And it it, it can portray this idea far better than I can explain it. There's no doubt about that. But I just wanted to talk about it today because I, I found it to be very thought provoking in that sense. So, um, and we continue on here. So I guess, <laughs> I guess I could have just been reading from my notes, but so what I put here is whether or not the rat is controlled uh, by its own decisions or the program initiated by an external source, it still is exhibiting a desired behavior using the same nervous system, the same brain. So, so whether or not something is programmed to do something, the behavioral output may be the same in the end, effectively blurring the lines between humans and advanced AI. And I've already explained this, um, kind of, kind of just off the cuff there, but that's, that's really what it is. If, if, uh, (laughs) if the behavioral output is so similar, maybe it doesn't matter where that programming came from, whether that programming came from, in the case of the rats, the electrical, uh, stimulation by the electrodes, by the researcher, or if that programming actually came from the genes to want to climb the ladder and similar to humans, whether, whether that programming came from our genes combined with the environment or that programming came uh, was created by a human who put the algorithm into the robot. If that behavioral output is the same, what does it matter where that programming came from? Just like the the Chinese room. Uh, if the output of the, he still is translating Chinese perfectly the same, and you can't tell if it's a human actually translating or if it's an AI, or in Mary's room thought experiment where, <clears throat> where, um, one one uh, thing may not feel the color. She may not actually feel what it's like to see, to see the color blue. She may just understand it. And then the human may actually feel the color. If they both look at the blue sky in awe and are like, wow, that's amazing. Maybe it doesn't matter about that programming. So that is just the most interesting thing ever that this movie got across. I, lo- I absolutely love that is, is the blurred lines between human and advanced AI. So... Um, now, if you continue this, uh, this research, there was, um, now to let, to a certain extent in humans, we can do, we can do this a little bit with, uh, trans transcranial magnetic stimulation, uh, otherwise known as TMS. Now this research is in its infancy and I don't know if all the studies have been replicated, but, um, there were, this is actually, this came from Homo Deus, the book, and he was talking about it a little bit. I was kind of skeptical when I was reading it because, um, I have not heard too much about these things since the book was released in 2016, but regardless, there are studies that indicate that it, um, TMS may enhance cognitive abilities in, in snipers who use the TMS helmets in simulation rooms. Uh, although, uh, as I mentioned, the research is extremely limited. So it's there was a little bit of research that was mentioned in homo deus that when you are wearing a trans transcranial magnetic stimulation helmet while you're sniping in a simulation room and this was done on soldiers you're a little bit quicker you're a little bit more sharp because you're controlled or at least influenced in a certain uh, extent to, uh, by this uh, uh, by this neural stimulation you get from the helmet so Uh, There's a little bit of research on that. Now, there is a very small sample size, and the long-term effects do remain unclear, but there is some potential there to modulate humans, kind of, um, I don't actually know the the term for it, if it's like uh, biomanipulation or bio, that's certainly not biomechanics, but whatever it may be, there's a little bit of uh, influence when you connect technology with, uh, with humans. And one thing <laughs> I know I've mentioned this guy a couple times already, but in a couple other episodes, but Elon Musk, he actually said that, um, when you, we, in a sense are all, oh, it's kind of like cyborgs. He says, we are kind of all, already in a sense like cyborgs, because when we want to know something, when we want to know what, uh, 8,000 times 362 is, or well, I don't know why we would want to know that. But if we want to know that, what do we do? We don't process it with our brain anymore. We actually just Google it that, or we use our calculator. So all there is is just a very long uh, time frame between we can get that answer. It, we basically, we don't know it, and then we got to take out our phone, punch it in, and then there's the answer. But eventually in the future, what Musk says is that, well, that's actually what he's working on right now is Neuralink. 
um, is that right when we want to know it, we'll just know it because our brain is already connected to that thing, um, to some kind of technology that a wrap that goes around your brain. It sounds very outlandish, but that's what's being worked on right now. Kind of like these TMS helmets. Um, your brain is kind of is connected to this system where there's like a, a zero latency uh, uh, connection, right? So you can just get any answer right away. So it's like you have Google like right in your mind, right when you want to know it. That's very scary, but this could be on the horizon. It's kind of all we're saying here. And it kind of goes along, uh, it go, goes along the same lines as uh, what we saw in the movie uh, Ex Machina. So now there are also other experiments kind of along the same lines again that show this potential for external control in rats from researchers. So a lot of studies, a lot of very interesting studies, definitely in the age of behaviorism uh, with Skinner that I mentioned in, uh, in the social media episode, studies sh have shown rats to forego food to the point of starvation in order to work for brain stimulation or intravenous cocaine when both food and stimulation are offered concurrently. So a rat, although you do need food to survive, of course, if you stimulate the right uh, pleasure centers in the brain or give them the correct things that will create pleasure in the brain like cocaine, it would rather go for that rather than food to the point of starvation. So that is just incredibly interesting kind of, um, kind of a bit like uh, a bit like what we're talking about already because um it, maybe yeah like the, if the if the pleasure circuits and the pleasure uh, chemicals are secreted in in the correct way then that leaves a lot of potential for control just like these rats because they didn't even go for food anymore because the, the reason we want food is because it stimulates the pleasure centers correctly and releases enough dopamine for us to want it to eat it right but if there's something else that's giving us that pleasure more pleasure than food maybe that's all we're, we'll care for as a matter of fact it is all we'll care about you look at drug addicts you look at individuals who are addicted to cocaine and these drugs a lot of the time they would rather spend that last ten dollars on on one more hit rather than um rather than food because it, it just gives them more pleasure so kind of just like these rats like it, it offers up a lot of capacity for control this research was done by uh as i mentioned kind of in the also in the mid 20th century so a few of the sources are olds and milner 1954 rotenberg and lindy 1965 and bozarth and wise 1985 if you want to check those articles out um just ask me i will i can send you the references or whatever but that's uh, the rats foregoing food um to to get brain stimulation or intravenous cocaine when and to the point of starvation that's just a very interesting thing um now, a lot of these studies get at the idea that we're hardly more than what our brain causes us to do. And if our brain can be manipulated to behave in a programmed way, maybe AI can also get to that point of behaving just like human, if programmed to be similar enough. Um, you know, I, th I think that's just, uh, it's incredibly interesting. So again, back to that same thing, we're all programmed in a sense. And I think that what, that's what the movie was really getting at is that the only difference is that we're just programmed by our genes. The robots are programmed by us, by an algorithm. So Nathan actually says in the movie, he's, he's the creator of these, these robots in the movie. And he says, um, Ava, the robot doesn't exist in isolation any more than you and me. She's part of a continuum version 9.6, 9.7, and so on. And each time they get a little better. So look at the parallel there with robots and and humans again are very advanced robots because um, the idea is that we're just like robots with updated versions when we choose to make changes or we improve so when we kind of say hey i'm not going to do this anymore or i'm going to start uh, running every day or i'm going to stop thinking this way that's actually like an updated version of you and you're literally changing your brain when you do things like that for a long enough period of time um you're changing your biology. There's that feedback there. So it is like you're now you're like version 9.6, 9.7. Um, <laughs> maybe if you make enough mistakes, you're back to 9.5 or whatever. But um, it, it, Nathan's kind of comparing us to, to the robots. Like we're both in a continuum and Ava just has different versions that we, pro, that I program her with 9.6, 9.7. But look at you, maybe you're, who knows what version you're on. Maybe you're on like version 10.1, 10.2. And then uh, the other day when you made that decision to, to do this, you moved up to 10.5 or whatever. So, so, um, 
Now, the only difference there is that we choose to make these changes and the robot has an external programming, an algorithm from us. So essentially Nathan chooses to update her to version 9.8, but for us, we make that on choice. But um, how much is it really we? How much am I really making the choice to make that update? There's even the philosophical debate, of course, as to what this we even is in the first place. What makes us free to choose? And are we even free um, in the first place? Or are we only a product of our genes plus environment? So this is the free will debate. And that is for another episode because that is just a, it's a bit mind boggling because it takes you down such a road of like philosophical thought that you, you almost get lost and it does it even have any meaning in the first place. It's so, um, it ends up being like almost to the point of being mundane as to whether we have free will or not, because does that even have any implications anyway? Like if I just chose to pick up that water bottle, or if I just, uh, chose to record this podcast today, uh, whether or not that was due to free will or not like the free will in, in the sense that it had nothing to do with my, my uh, genes and my brain and the environment, or whether it was only due to the <clears throat> my genes and my brain and the environment, then maybe <clears throat> maybe it doesn't really matter anyway. So like, so that's for another episode more than anything. But again, a lot of it, the movie did uh, kind of bring up some of these philosophical issues of um, um, kind of even of free will and uh, kind of comparing us to AI in the sense of the updated versions. Certainly, now. There's also the theme of with great power comes great responsibility, which I kind of already touched on a little bit. So in the movie, Nathan, the creator, um, he, he treats the robots like they were nothing and he really lacked empathy. <clears throat> now in reality, they were far more powerful than he could have ever imagined, of course. So, um, of course, Ava ended up tricking both Caleb and Nathan in the movie. So she manipulated Caleb to such an extent that she not only passed the test, <clears throat> excuse me, of being able to, to manipulate a human for her own means, but actually manipulated Caleb to make him trick Nathan by shutting down the security system. So she not only passed Nathan's test for her ability to manipulate a human, but actually escaped as well. So the test that Ava was going through that Caleb was brought in to do was to see if Caleb, if Ava could manipulate a human enough to allow her to theoretically escape this, this room or whatever. It turns out that she manipulated Caleb successfully to make uh, her, him feel feelings for her or whatever. The, and, but she also manipulated her own creator because she actually was able to really escape because the, she got Caleb to turn the security system off. So she manipulated them. Like it was like an inception of manipulation pretty much. <laughs> it was the craziest thing. So, um, this responsibility though, like, do we have a responsibility to treat these robots with any sort of empathy at all? Because Nathan, again, uh, pretty big spoiler is that she ends up killing, um, Nathan at the end of the movie, her own creator near the end of the movie. And, uh, why did she do that? Maybe because Nathan wasn't treating her with any empathy at all. So if she has some kind of learning system programmed and she didn't learn any empathy at all, maybe that's the case. So maybe with this power to be able to create these uh, artificial intelligence things um, or beings, we have some kind of responsibility to program them in a way that either that they will learn some form of empathy, so they won't do that. And she also ended up locking Caleb into the place that she was locked up in. She left with absolutely no empathy. Well, obviously because she is a robot, but, um, excuse me, but, um, but yeah, like the, the issue is just like, is there some kind of responsibility on us or not on us, but whoever is programming these things to, um, to give them some form of empathy or make them not, uh, make them not do these things. So, um, so yeah, I think that's a big issue there. And, you know, once the cat was out of the bag, there was no stopping her. So it's similar to, um, how once the AI cat is out of the bag in a more general sense, it could take over before we know it is kind of what the movie's getting at. So Nathan's last word actually, when he was killed by Ava was, um, or when he was killed by Ava was Ava, he kind of whispered Ava. So 
This kind of symbolizes how our last creation may be AI in the end, I think is what the movie was trying to get across. But the ethical issue there is kind of, as I was touching on was, is Nathan wrong for showing no empathy to the robot? You know, does, does she feel hurt when he shouts at her or, or he lacks empathy? Does she feel that pain anyways? Is it okay to be doing that, to push her around, to use her for whatever uh, things you want to use her for? Maybe it is. Maybe there was no issue with that. But Caleb, when he when he saw that, he was a little bit um, he was a little bit confused, or he was a little bit hurt when he he was empathetic for the robots when Nathan was kind of yelling at them to pick something up off the ground or whatever. But Nick, Caleb was actually being tricked because the robots maybe they didn't feel that anyway. So maybe it was okay to yell at them and shout at them. So that I think was very interesting. So it it raised that. Um, Kind of like this tantalizing ethical dilemma that are we responsible for showing empathy and kindness to even the most advanced of robots? Maybe we are, maybe we're not. That's more of a question and uh, maybe more of a discussion rather, more than anything. Like, uh, uh, there, I, 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 th I think the, the movie raised that issue, but it didn't really take one side or the other because clearly um, and Nathan's lack of empathy. Well, I can't even say clearly it didn't matter because maybe it did because maybe that's what Ava, why Ava wanted to kill Nathan in the end. So um, we don't really know. We don't know if if Nathan's uh, lack of empathy towards them made them act out against. Him. Maybe it was the fact that Nathan didn't correctly program the robots to have like some kind of like an off switch or um, make them have some kind of empathy for. Um, for him when when they were finally on the loose and to prevent them from killing so it puts some kind of responsibility on on us as creators like maybe um maybe we do need to have some kind of like ethical committees for these types of creations because maybe uh if we let the cat out of the bag we better make sure that the programming is correct um you know so i i think what it also kind of kind of got across was um how we can be sabotaged by being fixated on our own creation. Now, as I mentioned, Ava turned against her creator, leading Nathan to be killed by his own creation. So this is almost like a microcosm of, of what may happen if we continue going down this road of relentlessly advancing AI. So maybe the creator, us as humans, will be subsumed by, by our own creation, by the AI is kind of what this movie was saying. So now, I don't really know about, about that. I'm... I guess I'm a little more skeptical about this because for all the, uh, I guess you could say hype and hoopla we hear about artificial intelligence, how has it really had an impact on our lives? And I know there might be a lot of things that I'm neglecting and I've seen, I've of course seen the Boston Dynamics robots and um, <laughs> I've seen those things jump and run and do all sorts of things and it's pretty amazing. But when are we going to start to kick in? I mean, and obviously I should, I should not fail to mention Sophia, the robot that is very similar to Ava in this movie. And I'm wondering if Ava was taken a little bit as, um, because as an influence from Sophia, the robot, because I believe Sophia also has something on the back of her head where you can like see the circuits. I can't remember hundred percent, but Sophia is kind of a robot where if you talk to her, she can talk to you kind of similarly to how a human would converse with you, but it's almost closer to Siri in a way, <laughs> maybe a, a little more advanced than Siri, but you know, like when are we going to get to that point where we really can't tell the difference between humans and AI? I don't think we're, in, we're at that point yet. I'm more skeptical. I don't think we're even very close to that point yet. And when we look back on this podcast, give it a decade, give it 20 years, maybe we'll be able to do, <laughs> do a review and say, wait a minute, you should not have been skeptical about this because here the AI is coming now. But now some uh, or I also put here, like others are, are also more skeptical, but skeptical about AI and if it will ever get this powerful, like Ava in the movie. Um, because in the end, the issue is that uh, AI is a byproduct of our own consciousness anyway. So it really depends on us. If we can achieve the necessary insights to allow AI to advance, that's the issue. When we think that AI is going to be some kind of, um, master species, uh, by created by humans, is that not a little bit, um, I don't really know what you could say, but are we not a little bit overzealous? I think because 
it relies on our creation. So we have to make certain advancements before AI can advance too, because we are the programmers of these things. So if we can't find any new advancements or any new breakthroughs, AI is not going to go anywhere. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's up to us to, as to whether AI is going to be able to advance at a certain clip. We'll see if it's able to or not. But, um, now another kind of quote about how in the movie about how we can be sabotaged or fixated on our own creation is the idea that, um, K Caleb, he says, he's, he kind of has some reservations at first about Ava, but kind of Nathan keeps kind of prodding him along and pushing him along. And then Caleb finally says, I feel that she's amazing. And only when Caleb says that, Nathan says, cheers. And that's kind of all he wants to hear. It's his creation. All he wants, he doesn't want to discuss the semantics. He doesn't want to discuss any possible issues with his creation. He only wants to be told how good his work is. So he's, is that going to, is that, is that going to be what happens to us? Are we going to become over fixated on our creation? Are we going to, um, are we going to fall in love with it too much? So we won't slow down. We won't create ethical committees to put kind of put uh, some barriers to how how far we can create that could lead to our downfall maybe who knows so um as a matter of fact actually i put here uh, most men not most men both men in the movie become enamored with the ai in a certain sense so caleb literally ends up having feelings for ava and nathan actually uh has sex with another one. So they both kind of have some kind of feelings for these robots and become enamored in a sense with their own, with man's creation, man and woman's creation. So now the, the biggest issue there is that it actually is the humans who may have uh, a greater potential to be manipulated due to our emotional nature. Meanwhile, the AI feels next to nothing for us. So that's why Ava was able to plot uh, to kill Nathan and leave Caleb locked inside. Like, Ava, I thought you had feelings for me. But no, she just looks at him and keeps moving because um, she has no emotional nature or empathy programmed in. And that was the scariest thing because when you watch the end of that movie and you see Ava looks at Caleb, you thought they had a connection, but no. The robot had no connection at all. She was just manipulating Caleb. Caleb had this huge connection. So you're, as a human, you're kind of confused when you're watching because you're like, wait a minute, why would a girl ever uh, leave the guy that helped him escape? But it's not a girl, it's a robot. <laughs> that would be so amazing. So, <laughs> so uh, maybe it's not even wrong for Ava to do that if she doesn't have emotions. Like that's the other thing. So not only is it weird to see that, maybe it's not even wrong. Maybe it, if she's programmed to see if she can manipulate a human and she does it and she gets out and she looks at him with a blank face and sees looking at her pleading for help, uh, maybe it's not wrong because she wasn't programmed to have any emotions in the first place. So that's the other issue it raises. So, um, I thought, I thought that was really, I thought that was really incredible because, um, yeah, like if you're not, if, if we don't program them to be a certain way, then we can't be disappointed if they don't behave in the way we want them to behave. If we want them to behave that way, we got to program them in that way. So that raises some issues about who's creating these things. Cause the issue in this movie was that it was one creator creating the robots out of his own mind. So he didn't really have any checks and balances. He didn't have anyone to check him or to put a hold on some of his directions. If he wanted to program it with no empathy or he wanted to program a sex robot for himself, he did it. Now, when he, they escape and then other people are like, wait a minute, why, where's your, where's your empathy? Where's your, where are your feelings for me? Maybe there are none because the, that one creator came out of his own mind. So these AI things are coming out of our own mind. We got to realize that. So we got to put checks and balances there because nobody's perfect. People are going to want to create it for different ways. So maybe it's time to create some kind of board to, to at least like maybe not slow down the rate of progress, but to at least discuss some of the issues that we could face in the future if we, if we don't check ourselves. So some other issues raised uh, uh, about the responsibility for programmers to program the AI responsibly so these tragedies won't happen. Now, because the programming was made, as I mentioned, entirely by Nathan, there was no one to check him while he was doing things that could result in disastrous consequences. So um, I think that's the scariest thing. We, we, well, maybe not scary. We, we just need a team there. And if it's just one guy going rogue, uh, using all sorts of data to do these things, then who knows what the robot is going to end up like. So, um, 
I also mentioned here kind of going along with the same idea of um, we being uh, us as humans being fixed on our own creation a little bit. Um, so Caleb initially had reservations, as I mentioned, about the experiment uh, Nathan had him doing because it wasn't a real Turing test. So he says the reason uh, the real test isn't to first show you that she's a robot and then you see if she has consciousness. But Nathan, because he created this robot, he was kind of bullish to these reservations and because of his emotional investment in his own creation. That's what prevented him from putting a, um, of having some sort of system of checks and balances for his work and to make sure that what is, what he was creating was going to be, um, effective, not just for his own purposes, but kind of like for other, for humanity in general, if he was doing this. So, um, now, uh, Caleb's emotional connection to the robot also sabotaged him. Now, for Nathan, obviously, it sabotaged him. He ended up dying by his own creation. But Caleb, he was trapped in the in the uh, in Nathan's compound at the end of the movie, and he's now the rat in the box, um, looking through the windows uh, like like a subject, while the AI is dominant because he became fixed with the creation. He was over amazed with how Ava was and how Ava was pretending to like him in a sense, you know. So us getting fixated on our own creation could that lead to trouble especially with something as powerful as ai who knows but that's at least what this movie is uh seems to be getting across to a certain extent now um we also uh, finally the final thing here is the implications of data companies profiting from our personal data so um in the movie nathan the creator hacked the cell phones of everyone in the world all the manufacturers knew what he was doing but they couldn't say anything because they were doing it too now doesn't that remind you of what's happening right now with our data being uh sold uh and for companies profiting off of our data that we give them so it's almost showing what could happen if we keep going down the same route of companies mining our personal data for profit um and it sparks this discussion about how one rogue innovator like nathan in the movie could turn the tables for the worst if he has access to enough data if he goes rogue and he has the data showing um our search history and he knows how to create a language based on the data and all these things, it could end up spelling, spelling out uh, some negative consequences for us, you know? Um, and it, it kind of like how these big data companies, if, if they get into the wrong hands, like a Nathan, how could they turn against us? You know, because Nathan in the movie, he used Caleb's search engine inputs to bring Caleb in as the real rat in the experiment, rather than being Ava, obviously Ava, he just had to bring someone in for Ava to see if she could manipulate, right? Now, Caleb became a puppet for Ava to play with because of the data Nathan collected about Caleb. Um, for instance, Nathan knew what Caleb found attractive, um, and he knew his browsing history that would make him more inclined to be influenced and have feelings for Ava. So he actually was using Caleb's personal data. He looked at all the data of all the people in the world and Caleb was the perfect guy to come in for Ava to win the experiment and to be manipulated by that. So because he had access to so much data, kind of like these companies have right now, which is, excuse me, why, why, uh, why this movie is so, so critical or was so critical when it was released was because it kind of mirrors some of the things that are happening right now anyways. And if it goes off the rails in a hundred years, what's going to happen guys, if, if, if this continues, right. Um, no, I do, I do like some of the, um, initiatives. It seems like some of the big companies have put in place and guys, I don't think these big companies are, uh, completely uh, malevolent in any way. Maybe some of the things they do are, but I think there are some things they're doing to give us a private browsing mode or give us certain things that keep our data private. And we have some options at least, you know, but does everyone know how to use those things? Like <laughs> another thing, for instance, on like Google Chrome on your phone, when you open a new tab, it, it automatically opens up to the non-private browsing mode, right? So you actually have to X out of that, click, um, on your phone, you got to X out of that tab and go to the private one and go to that. I don't know if there's a setting where you can automatically open the private tab, but it kind of like has, uh, um, the pre uh, the, uh, the pre-programmed thing is just to open up a non-private browsing tab. So your data can be flowing in, you know, and look at a 67 year old person who's just using Google Chrome. I mean, 
do they know how to turn on private browsing mode? So, um, but, but I do think these companies are taking some good steps, but I think this movie more is like, it's like a hypothetical thing. Like if it gets into the wrong hands, who knows what can happen you guys. So, um, now I think, I think that's it. I think that's what, what this movie got across to me guys. And, uh, I hope if you watch it, or if you just decided to listen to this podcast without watching it, I hope uh, you took something from it, either from the movie or just from this podcast about um, kind of some of the issues with artificial intelligence. And I think this is a quicker one. Let me just check it. 55 minutes. So I've only released a few. So, <laughs> so this is like, uh, I guess, a longer one. Um so far but next one coming i'm actually going to record that right after this because i'm so excited for that one that one's probably going to be a bit longer than this but um thank you guys for listening in if you made it to 56 minutes i appreciate that um now if you guys are liking what you're hearing uh it's up to you how you want to support it i think everybody knows uh how to rate on itunes or I myself don't even know how to rate on Spotify, but if you forgot how to do that, feel free to do that. Um, you can like it if you're watching it on YouTube, you can comment, you can do whatever. Um, a couple other ways. I think the best way though, is just share it with people. Like one thing I love to do is, um, I love to, I don't love to do, but I take, sometimes I take a screen recording of a certain part that I like. I send it to a friend of a certain podcast that I like, or uh, a certain YouTube video that I like if you're watching it on YouTube. So share it with others, guys, share the whole episode, share just a little bit. It doesn't matter to me if you like it. If you don't like it, what have I been saying? Don't share it. But if you do feel free to share it, guys. Um, also we do have a Patreon now. So if you like it that much, you feel like it's worth, um, anything at all, you can donate, uh, three bucks. Uh, you can donate whatever, or you can donate three, cancel it immediately. But guys, there's a lot of ways to support it. You can go to the website, you can go wherever, but, uh, do whatever if, if you're liking it, because I'm going to keep rolling out these episodes, whether I get one view, whether I get a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand or a million, I don't care. I'm going to be rolling it out. So if you like it, be one of those supporters, do, do, do whatever you can even leave a review. No one's left an actual review on iTunes. That'd be pretty crazy, but, um, I'm going to keep, we're going to keep rolling. We're not stopping. Cause I love doing this. I love, I love analyzing these things. Um, and oh, I, yeah, also the new mic that I got. This is the new setup. I forgot to mention that. And uh, I'm excited about this for um, for anyone who obviously watches Joe Rogan or whatever. This is the mic. So I was so excited to get this. Um, and we're going to keep rolling out episodes because this is the... Right now, if if you are watching this in the way in the future, like uh, a few years from now, this is during the coronavirus pandemic. So this is where everybody's inside anyway. So I was lucky to be, get my hands on this mic right before all the shipping times were like through the roof. Right. So I was able to get this, get all set up and luckily I'm inside. Right. So I can record, I can do whatever because this is, uh, I'm inside anyway. I don't need to go outside to do this. So everyone stay safe out there. Um, stay smiling, stay happy, stay positive. And we're going to drop this and we're going to drop another episode right after this. So thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it. And, uh, I'm just super excited to keep going with this, keep analyzing and keep having in-depth discussion into a diverse set of topics. Love you guys. Peace.